Welcome to the second video in the data analysis part of the skills module. So we've seen how in principle we can generate knowledge using the idea of falsification and the hypothetico deductive model by setting up hypotheses and then trying as hard as we can to falsify them. Great, well let's go and do it. Uh, unfortunately in the real world when we actually try to generate knowledge using this method we quickly run into two problems. First, individuals are variable, no two are alike. So for example, we can't make the assumption that one person or 10 people or even a thousand people are representative of all people. This wouldn't be a problem if we could examine every single individual on the planet, but it turns out we can't, and that's the second problem. Instead, we have to take a sample, and that sample is pretty much certainly going to be different from the population in general. The larger sample we take, the better the approximation to the entire population we get, but effectively we just have to assume that our sample is representative of that population, and we can never truly know. How do we get round this? So this is the point where we meet Ronald Fisher, who is known as the father of modern experimental design, or at least the father of one of its main schools of thought. You may meet some of the others later in your degree. Fisher's work isn't directly linked to Popper's, whom we met in the last video, but he worked roughly at the same time as Popper and came up with similar ideas about falsification. Except Fisher was a biologist, not a philosopher, and set the idea of falsification into a framework that we can actually use in the real world. If we want to really try and falsify an idea, said Fisher, what we really want to know is how well the data in the sample we observe fit with the idea we've proposed. We want to ask, if my idea were true, how unusual would my observations be? In other words, what we ideally want is a measure of the chances of getting the data we've got under the assumption that our idea is true. If these chances are really low, that is, our observations would be really unusual if our idea were true then that would be grounds to reject our idea. This is good because we can do this. Let's say our idea is that horses weigh an average of 500 kilograms. We can predict very precisely what we would expect a sample of randomly chosen horses to look like under this assumption. So if we weigh 20 horses and they all weigh somewhere between 400 and 600 kilograms, this would be quite likely if our idea were true. And we can take this as support for or at least non-rejection of, our idea. But if our 20 horses all weighed more than a 1,000 kilograms, then getting this sample would be extremely unlikely to happen by chance if the true average weight of horses were in fact 500 kilograms. So this would be grounds for rejecting our idea. Fisher proposed that we should reject a hypothesis when the data we observe are less than 5% likely under that hypothesis, we call this the threshold for significance, or p-value. This is a value you'll meet time and time again over the course of your training as a scientist, and it's really worth hammering into your head exactly what it means. It is the chances of getting the data when you assume the hypothesis you are testing to be true. You'll be calculating this many times in our workshops. But here we run into a big problem. Let's say we've proposed an idea horses are bigger than zebras. We've taken a data sample that is meant to test that idea. We've weighed 20 horses and 20 zebras. Now it happens that in our sample there's quite a lot of overlap. Our biggest zebra is bigger than some of our horses and our smallest horse is smaller than some of our zebras. So we want to know if we see a difference between horses and zebras is this because our idea is correct? Or is it just because of random chance due to individual variability? Did we just happen to pick 20 huge horses and 20 tiny zebras, when in fact horses and zebras are on average the same size? The problem we run into is that the idea we've proposed, as we have stated it, is not really refutable. In order to falsify the idea that horses and zebras are a different size, you'd have to show the opposite i.e. you'd have to show that the sizes of horses and zebras are not different and any apparent differences you observe in your sample are down to random chance. 
This is almost impossible to show, because individual variability makes it impossible to rule out the idea that horses and zebras are actually different. Even if the samples look roughly the same, because of variability, they're never going to be actually the same, and we can never completely rule out the idea that the average sizes of horses and zebras are really a tiny bit different. Fisher suggested we should instead taste the, test the negation of this hypothesis, i.e. that horses are not bigger than zebras, and he called this the null hypothesis. This is important because falsifying the idea that two things are the same is easy. Just like before, we know exactly what the chances are of observing these exact weights of 20 horses and 20 zebras if in reality horses and zebra weights are the same. If this probability, or the p-value, turns out to be less than 5%, we reject our null hypothesis and we conclude that horses and zebras have different weights. Another good reason that null hypotheses appeal to many scientists is because science proceeds conservatively, always assuming that something interesting is not happening, unless we can provide convincing evidence that suggests, at least for the moment, that something might be going on. Before computers, we had to look up this probability based on a huge set of tables that Fisher devised. But now our computer will tell us in an instant. It is this that we will be doing in our workshops. The exact kind of statistical test we'll use will depend on what kind of question we're actually asking. For example, are we looking for trends or are we looking for differences? And also on the kind of data we've gathered, whether they're measurements or counts or something else. But the philosophy of testing the null hypothesis is exactly the same in each case. And that is why I've introduced it first before we dive into the different kinds of tests themselves. We'll meet these different kinds of tests in the next few videos and in our lectures.